Hello again. I've posted a few times here about some of my creepy experiences, which have received some positive feedback so I thought I'd share another. So back in 2014 when I was 21 I was in an on again off again toxic relationship and was trying to get over him and move on so I thought I'd give dating sites a crack. I tried a few, met a few guys. Some decent that never went anywhere and some that were just plain looking for sex or had serious issues. I hadn't dated since high school as I'd been in two long-term relationships fairly close together with people that I had known for a while. As I'm sure you can imagine, I was clueless. I wasn't used to guys trying to trick me into sex, or leading me on or even how dating really worked. How many days after the date do I have to wait to text him? After a few failed attempts to find someone, I thought I'd broaden my horizons and really try to find someone serious. At the time I was talking to a couple of guys. The one that stood out was a really nice, if not slightly simple guy who I had a lot in common with, Liam. I didn't want to put my eggs in one basket so I started talking to another guy that wasn't really my type, physically or mentally, but he was smart and funny so I thought I'd see how things played out seeing as most of the guys that I picked based on gut feelings turn out to be terrible. This man who I nicknamed, Guy, can't remember why now but it was a running joke between us, was very, very persistent and very cocky which I wasn't really into, but he seemed like a cool guy on the other hand, was very knowledgeable, quick-witted and easy to talk to. We spoke on the phone a few times and it was a reasonably good experience but there was something about him I just didn't really like. As I mentioned previously, he was quite cocky and used to do little annoying things like hang up without saying goodbye and had an arrogant, pushy demeanor. One day on the phone, I pulled him up on it and told him I believed that it was all a front and that he wasn't that arrogant and he was a lot nicer than he let on. He told me that he had an ex-girlfriend who broke up with him because he was too much of a pushover, so he decided that women like guys that were on the arrogant side. I told him I didn't at all, and I spoke to him because I felt there was something more than that to his personality. I also picked him up on little things in his profile such as not liking fat chicks and other things. I'm a bigger girl so I asked him if that was a problem to which he responded that it wasn't, he had just written that to make himself look better. I accepted his excuse and hoped for the best. I decided I needed to try different kinds of men if I wanted to find someone so I gave the guy a chance. He often suggested meeting at his place over pizza and movies, which I wasn't quite comfortable with, so I suggested he come out to a club with a few friends which he declined and tried to convince me to come back to his place to which I wasn't really keen on. After he noticed that I wasn't coming over to his house in the middle of the night, he suggested we go out for coffee. As I didn't drive, he suggested that he'd pick me up, which I didn't really think was a good idea, but agreed in the end. We decided to go to a local coffee shop that I was quite fond of, which was open throughout the night. At around 8 he picked me up and we exchanged pleasantries and once we were seated, I was genuinely surprised by his attentiveness and how much interest he displayed, asking me many questions about myself. Still, something didn't sit right. It wasn't that I didn't like him. There was just something that made me feel uncomfortable. All went well, we chatted about this and that, until the question took a strange turn. Have you ever just kissed anyone just simply because you were horny? He asked rather loudly considering we were in a crowded cafe. I was taken aback, and embarrassed, and hesitated before stuttering, uh, no. Not really. I think that's more of a male thing, I can't say I've done that. No. Sound sexist, shut up I was under pressure. He then asked me a few more innocent questions before switching the topic back, asking if I liked oral sex and other oddly worded questions that I can't remember. Sexual questions that were unusual. I lightly told him that it was rude to ask me that but still was tolerant of him. I've encountered many douches and at that time felt I wouldn't get much better. Not long after this, he suggested we leave. By this I thought he meant part ways, as he knew I had to meet up with a friend not long after coffee. I was wrong. We went to the counter and he offered to pay, to which I declined. Luckily he did because ironically, I had left my wallet at home. I felt like it was such a cliche but felt super guilty as it makes me feel bad when anyone pays for me. When we got in the car, he started to drive a different direction to where I lived, which was five minutes away. I asked where we were going and he pulled up in a street nearby with little to no street lights that were extremely dim and parked outside a random house. I asked him what we were doing there and he told me he wanted to talk in private, to which I responded that we could talk in private out the front of my house. He argued that it wouldn't be private and that people would look out of windows. 
I stupidly told him that no one would because only my sister was home and I would text her not to. He kicked up a bit and got slightly angry before agreeing to take me home. This should have been enough for me, but no. I was naive and lonely. When we parked out the front of my house, we started talking and he tried to lean in to kiss me, to which I kept pulling away and giving off negative body language but still was friendly. After a bit he started asking me to look at him to which I made jokes, sometimes in stressful situations. I make jokes to clear the tension, bad habit, and kept my distance until he basically turned my head and kissed me. I just went with it as I was lonely and thought he wasn't that bad looking and I reasoned that a kiss was just a kiss. After a few seconds I tried to pull away and he pulled me into a bear hug to which I have hard heartedly tried to get out of but gave up and continued kissing him. A little while later I tried to pull away and he put me in almost a headlock type hold. Still somehow I wasn't concerned enough to get the hell out of there. We stopped kissing after a bit and continued talking. He asked if I'd sit in the back seat with him to cuddle to which I hesitantly said yes. Once we got in the back we cuddled and talked but then he kept grabbing at my boobs and vagina. I just kept telling him to stop because it was pissing me off. He was doing it in a jokey way, like, whoops, accidentally brushed your boob. I didn't take it too seriously until it happened a few times and I told him that he had had his feelings, and enough was enough. I wasn't good at saying no to men back then, not that it's any excuse. After a couple of times I said I was moving to the other side of the car so he couldn't touch me. I sat there and we continued talking when all of a sudden he reached out and pulled me in for a cuddle. He was playing with my hair when all of a sudden he pushed my head down, hair wrapped in his hands. I was confused and tried to push my head back up, but when he roughly pushed it down again, I realized what he was doing. I don't know how I did it, guy was around 6 feet 2 inches and 120 kilograms, but I managed to get myself out of his grip and get out of the car. As I was getting out he yelled out to come back, but he didn't do anything. You know what you fucking did. Thanks for the fucking coffee, I said as I slammed his door in his face. I walked quickly but steadily to my front door even though I was petrified as I didn't want to give him the satisfaction of seeing me running. He continued yelling out that he had done nothing wrong the whole time I was walking. I banged down my front door and my younger sister opened it, to see me in tears. I told her what happened and eventually settled down. I swiftly blocked him on Facebook and vowed never to talk to him again. I kid you not, three days later while at work, I received a text message from him. Guy. Hey you wanna get coffee tonight? Me, no. Him, why reply then? After an hour of no response. Him, I see what you did there. Me, I'm just curious why you'd even bother asking. Him, cause I think you're cute. I'm curious why you're answering. Me, you smell like hidden motives, get away from me. Him, pretty sure my motives tasted fine when my tongue was down your throat the other night. I never made contact again after that and blocked his number. A few years on, I was telling someone about him and decided to unblock him on Facebook to show her when I noticed that I now had a mutual friend. The mutual friend was a girl I had been extremely close with in high school who confessed to me that she had been raped from a child onward. I was the only one she had ever told and I helped her find the courage to put the piece of shit away so naturally I freaked and messaged her. I told her the whole story and she was stunned. She told me that he worked with her and now lectured about justice at a local university which was laughable. She told me that he had harassed her for months about going on a date with him and would occasionally get quite nasty. In all the time she knew him she felt uncomfortable around him even when he was nice. He chopped and changed quite regularly apparently, and she felt kinda intimidated most times. He would guilt, pressure, and have a go at her about this date or not messaging him back etc. Very full on almost stalkerish. She ended up getting a boyfriend and he was furious and she didn't hear from him after that. Judging by our time frames, she met him around three to six months after I did. I'm sure I've left some details out as it's all a bit blurry and my dad died after the event with him so if I remember anything else I will add to it. Thanks for reading. So, to start, I'm a transgender woman. I'm single and I make my status as trans very clear on all my dating profiles, except plenty of fish, because they consider that to be talking about sex, and they will straight up ban you, so I state instead that I'm a huge proponent of trans rights. So this guy messages me, he lives about an hour away. Kinda cute in a mildly creepy way, like, 
something seems a little off about him, but people can't help how they look, so I give him a chance, just like I would want. I discovered he's a smoker, but he says he's trying hard to quit and only does it when he's really stressed or upset. We have a nice conversation and finally he asks for my number, and without thinking about it, I give him the number but tell him I'm getting ready for my evening classes so I'll be slow to respond. A few minutes go by and I get a message. Hi, it's me from Plenty of Fish. Now, usually, I send, standard quick message, hi, it's Ali, so, just to be clear since my profile might be a little vague, I'm a transgender woman. I know that's not everyone's cup of tea so if you're not interested I completely understand. About 20% of the time the guy isn't interested and gets rude and needs to be blocked and the other 80% is split between immediate inappropriate questions and dick pics, casual acceptance, or dead silence. But like I said, I was getting ready to go to class, so I hadn't sent the message yet. A few minutes go by and I'm about to text him my standard when I get another text. Who the hell is this guy? And why is he paying your cell phone bill? I reply, where did you even get that name? He says, answer the question, who is he? I'm honestly stunned at this point, and I realize he must have paid one of those shady websites that offer personal info for a fee. Well if you must know, I'm transgender and that used to be my name. I was about to tell you when you pulled that stunt. Please do us both a favor and lose my number, that's incredibly invasive and I don't want to talk to you anymore. Do you still live at this address in this state? I'm coming to see you so we can talk about this in person. Me, lying, no, I moved a few months ago, and I'm getting ready to head out like I said, you need to leave me alone. Don't contact me again. Him, since you have something to hide I'm going to run a full background check on you. You lied to me and I don't appreciate that. Me, I'm sending screen caps of this conversation your POF profile and your photos to my two best friends who work in law enforcement in your town and my ex-boyfriend who I'm still on good terms with who works for the local sheriff's office. Don't text me again. I didn't hear anything else from him for a few weeks. I made sure my doors and windows were locked, and the aforementioned friends and ex would check up on me from time to time. Eventually it just became one of those weird things that makes you laugh uneasily. And then one day I thought I saw him at the local grocery store. Same dark hair, thick glasses frames, and just, creepy guy, staring at me, watching me as I shopped. I texted my ex about it, and as an upswing on things, my ex and I got back together in a casual sort of way, and he stayed the night a few times a month off and on. One night when I was alone though, I just kept getting this weird feeling, and smelling smoke. I lived in a little apartment complex that were three separate apartments that shared walls, but no plumbing or air ducts. I don't smoke and I'm very sensitive to the smell thanks to asthma. The apartment had a wall unit AC, so I turned it off since it was apparently pulling air in from a neighbor's guest who must have been chain smoking, I thought. I had an ASL video due the next morning, so I was up all night practicing and recording the video, signing the same story over and over again until it was almost a dance rather than narration. A couple of times I had to restart the video because my cat was going nuts. Finally around 7 a.m. I had the video finished and sent in, and was ready for bed, so I double-checked all the doors and windows were locked, set an alarm and went to sleep. I woke up and got ready for school, was running a bit late and had to hurry out the door, but I noticed something weird but didn't have time to stop and register. Classes went smoothly, I got an A-plus on my ASL video, and I stopped for groceries on my way home from class. As I got home I saw what had been bugging me. Each apartment had a small garden on each side of the porch. Mine was nothing but gravel and pavers the previous tenant had put in, but it was tidy, except for a pile of cigarette butts that looked like someone had dumped their car ashtray in my garden. There was no other trash, just that pile, right in front of my bedroom window. I don't think anything about it at first, and just get a broom and dustpan and sweep it up. As I'm doing it my neighbor, an old man, comes out and asks if my boyfriend ever got a hold of me. I ask him what he means, he tells me there was a young man waiting for me on my front porch off and on for a few hours last night, that he'd seen the guy around before and thought he was my boyfriend. I ask what he looked like. Dark hair, thick glasses, chain smoking. I text them again off again X, cops take statements and I give them the screenshots. I moved out of state a few weeks later, for unrelated reasons, and have legally changed my name since, 
with closed records. I don't give guys my number anymore. Ladies and my fellow queer family, use a texting app until you get to know someone, because for like $5 creeps can get everything from your number. Hello all. I'm a 28-year-old female, so this story is from years ago. Please enjoy reading this as much as I had sharing it. Let's just say my name is Jennifer for the story's sake. I haven't been back to the same place since and I always shared this story with my friends. It has become a favorite, whether they believe me or not. This is somewhat of a throwaway account because I don't want to be pinned down to where I am. I usually visit my family's cottage up north not going to disclose specifically where for privacy reasons, every summer and on the occasion on July 4th, Thanksgiving etc. It's a waterfront cottage, facing a lake, surrounded by a dense forest. It's located on a private beach, so you see your neighbor every once in a while. Everyone comes up north around the same time so it wouldn't be uncommon to have a chat with others and thus, everyone knows each other and subsequently, their business. My cottage sits between two others, one is inhabited quite frequently and one is abandoned, to my knowledge. My family and neighbors know that a European family, possibly Polish, German, etc., owns it. I just assume that they hold on to the property to maintain some sort of tangible asset in the United States. Back when I was young, around the ages of 18 to 20 my cousins, brothers, and I would get away from our family to smoke weed in the abandoned cottage to avoid any sort of scolding. It was fun, an empty cottage with some furniture that was a time capsule from the 80s. We would peer around and look at the old brown love seat, the dark den, the main living room adjoining the dining area and the cute little kitchen with old wine glasses laying around. It was resoundingly acknowledged that others have been through the abandoned cottage as well. There were smoke joints on the ground, footprints, old beer bottles with modern labels and furniture was always moved around from one position to another. However, the cottage was never spruced up was never clean nor organized. So we knew that the owners weren't coming by, it was random explorers, perhaps other teenagers, doing the same thing we did. Upon some curious investigation, we saw a basement. We opened the door and saw a staircase that led to a floor that was pure dirt, it looked like a cellar from what I could see. I stood at the top of the stairs looking down and saw exposed brick, nothing particularly interesting. Of course we would freak each other out, saying someone lives down there that there was a serial killer living there, or there was a corpse collection buried under the dirt floors. So, none of us would go down there with our independent conviction, it would have to have been a dare or a display of bravery. One day, around Thanksgiving, four of us, three girls, and my brother, went to the abandoned cottage to smoke some joints and gossip about family. I don't see my cousins much, only during special occasions, so we sat on the tables in the dining area to smoke, chill and chit-chat. Of course, the topic of the basement came up. We laughed and talked about who would go down there, who would most likely survive the serial killer living beneath us waiting for his next victim to enter his abode. We turned and noticed the basement was unlocked and this was unusual, since it was always locked. The one occasion where it was unlocked was when we took a look, or one of my brothers would go down there to freak all the girls out and prove his macho, so to speak. We would always lock it afterwards, purely out of the feeling of some sort of reassurance. We chalked it up to other teenagers just like us having visited the cottage before us, and all of us girls made my older brother get up and lock the door. He stood, looked us all up and down and jokingly said something along the lines of, You guys are just pussies, always get a man to do the scary thing for you. We laughed, but he was the guy, if there was someone down there, he would be the most likely to defend himself. He's a big guy. 210 pounds and 6 inch 5. He took maybe three steps before there was a knock, it sounded like a knock on a hollow surface. Considering that this cottage was quite old, I thought that it came from the side of the building. I don't think there's any significant insulation that would prevent an audible knock. I instantly looked at my brother, who looked smug. He said, You know, if you ask me to do something for you, don't mess with me whilst I'm doing you a favor. I looked around, waiting for one of the two other girls, my cousins, to fess up and mock his masculine courage. It seemed like everyone was resoundingly confused, anxious and waiting for the same thing. 
I guess my brother saw their reactions and did not see mine, and concluded that I was the source of the suspicious knocker since my back was turned to him. Very funny Jenna. You think you are such a joker? My brother said with a chuckle. I turned to him, and I guess he saw my anxious face as well. I guess he could read me well. I thought that maybe him walking on the old floors unsettled some of the structural integrity of the building. Maybe it was one of our parents messing with us. I didn't think it was from a foreign source. I quipped at him, just go and lock the door. He continued walking toward the door but it opened slightly, he stopped dead in his tracks immediately. We're going now, the hell with that freaking door, one of my cousins sternly said. We all got up from sitting on the tables, we gathered our things including weed, beer bottles, and phones. We quickly ran to the front door, not daring to look back. My brother was the last of the anxious conga line that was created by the bottleneck of the lone exit. I heard significant footsteps coming from the back of the cottage, I thought it was my brother, and I turned back and I swear to God I saw a hand opening the basement door. Oh my God! I yelled, there's someone in the freaking basement. I managed to shakingly say after running down the stairs that led to the front door. What? Everyone else said. My brother looked back, holy shit. He held onto the sides of my arms to push me to go faster. Go, we heard a foreign voice say. We ran faster, dropping bottles, pipes, and shoes. We ran so fast that our flip-flops flew off. I knew it wasn't any of us. Not even one of our parents, it was a low, stern voice from afar, my brother was right behind me. We made our escape to our cottage thoroughly flustered and terrified. There was a homeless guy in there, I freaking saw him. My brother, out of breath, managed to say. I guess it was common knowledge that the place was abandoned. I wouldn't neglect the possibility of someone taking refuge there. I don't know if the guy went into the basement when he heard us coming then got tired of sitting on the dirt floor then scared us. I don't know. It's a private beach, so you would have to know of the specific location to be able to understand how to get there then also know that there's an abandoned property as well. I also know that there are squatters. To offer a further explanation. People share on Reddit that there are certain locations in our area where you could set up camp on a vacant lot and take a day to sit on the quiet beach. But I know that neighboring properties crack down on it pretty quickly and let them know that they can't settle there. I thought that would have been a good explanation. We ran to our parents after proactively hiding our wheat stash, our priorities are certainly well placed. And told them our story, they called the police and we watched from afar to see what the hell was going on. I guess the guy left. The police came to us and told us no one was in there, but they let us know to file some sort of report regarding the abandoned nest of the cottage. I think there are some sort of laws that demand that the owner should be using the cottage and executing upkeep. None of us really cared for being the Karens of the situation, so we never filed such a report. At the end of the day, I understand that some people just want to have assets, whether they're shitty or not. It would suck to lose out on good property in a nice location. I think they might come back one day since our neighbors know of the family. No one else has ever filed a report to my knowledge. I guess the experience didn't shake up my brother too much since he went back and gave me details. He found some dead squirrels and baby raccoons just laying in the living room. He said they looked quite fresh. I think that they died of natural causes but. How do two different species of animals just die in the same place? I asked him if they were mangled or obviously killed in some way and he said no. He said the baby raccoons had fur. I did some research and I know that baby raccoons aren't born with fur, so I deduced that they were alive for some time then somehow died in the living room. I don't want to know if something or someone killed them there. Or maybe killed them in another place and then brought them in there to give some sort of message to any oncoming visitors. I hope it isn't the homeless guy. I'm going to preface this by saying, I was incredibly naive. My best friend, Jay used to work at a restaurant in a very bad area, she had moved there from our little suburb about 35 minutes away. I still lived in the suburbs with my parents, so my street smarts weren't the best. This was three years ago, I was 19 at the time, so driving around to visit friends was, and is, one of my favorite pastimes. One day, I decided to stop by the restaurant to see Jay, as I'd done it a few times before and I was friends with all her co-workers. My friend was busy and she made me wait around with a few of the others for a bit until her break, then came to chat with me. At this time, 
I was very anti-purse and just kept a wristlet, a little wallet you can keep around your wrist. After chatting for about 30 minutes, I left the restaurant and walked back to my car. After driving for a while, I noticed I had left my wallet, so I texted Jay telling her to grab it for me and where I had probably left it. I already knew there was a possibility that it was gone, being that I had left it in a busy restaurant in Center City, and Jay confirmed it was indeed gone. My dad cancelled all the credit cards, but I was still holding on to hope that it would be returned, as I did have my ID in there. The next day, I got a text from Jay. She tells me someone called the restaurant and said they had my wallet, and that she had given them my number. I was really happy about this, but knew I would have to meet up with the stranger, so I decided not to tell my parents. I didn't get a text until the next morning. The person said that they had my wallet and wanted to give it back, but never have a name or description. I didn't care, I thanked them profusely, and asked when I could meet them. Hours later, they replied with an address and told me to stop by around 9 p.m. The address was about 20 minutes from the restaurant, which was also a really bad area but that didn't worry me as I had left my wallet right around there. I got there around 9, and this is when I started to get freaked out. The house looked like it was previously a row home, but the one connecting it to the rest had been demolished. The windows were boarded up, and there were no lights coming from inside. The place was obviously abandoned, grass overgrown, weeds everywhere, graffiti all over it, you get the idea. The door, however, was not boarded up and I could see it was ajar. I texted the number, and the person replied a second later telling me to come in. It was early summer, so while it wasn't completely dark out, it was getting there and I would have needed a flashlight to see. So what do I do? Well, turn on my flashlight, of course. I get out of the car, and look around in hopes of seeing someone. Nothing. So with the phone flashlight in hand, I start walking up the dry rotted wooden steps to the front door. I crack the door open further. It's completely black, and when I shine my flashlight around, I can see there's no furniture. I thought I heard some quiet creaking from the upstairs, which I thought was strange. Why would the person text me to come in but then be hiding upstairs? At this point I knew there was something wrong here, I was scared as hell, and I hightailed it back to my car. I should have pulled around the corner but I didn't, I just called the police right there. Two policemen arrive shortly after and walk right into the house with flashlights. Then two more pull up. They were inside for a long time, then they came out. With them, in handcuffs, are two skinny, scraggly, homeless looking guys. I only got a good look at one, but I do remember the guy had visible sores on his face and arms, I assumed they could be drug related. As the cops walked them by my car, one of the guys looked in at me with the angriest expression I've ever seen. Two of the officers came over to talk to me and had indeed found my wallet inside. All the money was gone, but the rest was intact. The cops reprimanded me for being so stupid. I drove home and never spoke of it to my parents, only recently have I told them what happened. I'll never know what those guys were planning. Was it just someone messing with me, and I called the cops on two random homeless guys living there? I never got another text from that number. I started carrying a purse after that. Gross creepy abandoned house men. Let's never meet again. Ever. I work in food service, front of house, so, in the early days of the pandemic with restaurants closed, I was taking work wherever I could find it. An old friend clued me into a medical office that needed someone to come in and do a bit of light filing. I was able to go in at night to limit direct contact with people, so I jumped at the opportunity right away. Ironically the medical office job had been the safest I'd gig been offered thus far, COVID-wise. I wanted to avoid the bus if I could, due to crowds, so decided to swing for a rideshare app. It's not all that expensive in my area and I really didn't want a virus. I headed in at almost 3am because it was after the cleaning crew had left. I was kicking myself for being so cautious, though, because I was exhausted. I stumbled onto the block looking for my ride and to my tired self's great relief the car spotted me almost immediately and pulled up asking, Uber? While I cluelessly wandered up and down the street searching. The ride was taking a while, but I'd only just moved here last year, so I'm not familiar with all of the surrounding areas and thought nothing of it. I was pretty alert at first, so I was trying to pass the time playing games on my phone and stuff. But the car didn't have a compatible phone charger and I wasn't sure the building would have one. 
so I wanted to save my battery to be able to call a ride back. I shut my phone down into airplane mode and eventually drifted off from a combination of tiredness and boredom. I don't often take ride shares so being alone with a strange driver often put me a bit on edge but this guy had a pretty boring car and a very standard look about him. He looked a little like my brother even. Young, clean kept, listening to jazz, nothing that screamed you need to micromanage this trip. When we arrived the driver tried to wake me up by calling to me from the front but I was in too deep of a sleep and couldn't fully distinguish it from my dream. Finally he awkwardly jimmied my leg to wake me up and kept saying, Mayam, Mayam, we're here now. I was embarrassed that I'd gotten that out of it so I just hurriedly said, thanks, and booked it out of the car and into the building. As I looked around I began to realize nothing was what I had expected of an office park. I had seen a street view of the building when I first looked up the business and it had appeared to be a strip mall plaza. The further I went the more loudly alarm bells were ringing in my gut. The structure was semi-dilapidated and it was pitch black dark past the entryway. I expected some lights to be off in the nighttime, but not to the whole building. I skittered across the concrete foundation comprising what was left of the lobby area, told myself they must just be renovating, and followed signs for the stairs. After what felt like ages but was likely just a few minutes, all I had passed was construction equipment, a couple locked doors, and some smashed windows. I was certain I was not going to find a medical office and figured maybe I had mixed up the address. I took out my phone to double check, but once I got it out of airplane mode, I could barely get a signal. I kept moving around in the building, pacing, looking for a stronger signal. I eventually confirmed in my text that I had written down the correct address just by scrolling back, which didn't require service. Since I had only been inside for a few minutes at most, I figured I should try and get in touch with the driver, because if I entered the correct address then it was only fair he should continue my ride to the correct place and save me the added fees of calling a second trip, considering this was all his mix-up. The app was taking forever to load with my slow service, but before I could get to a cloud of reception. I heard a rustling sound in the lower level of the building. I was on the top floor and the only stairwell I was aware of was the one I had taken up, so it would force me into the middle of the building. There was no way to exit the situation without encountering whoever was downstairs. In an abandoned building in the latest hours of the night I figured the chances were high that it was a tweaker, and I had no desire to try slipping past a tweaker, especially when it was late enough that they were probably on something, so jumpy and on edge. I tried to get a text out to a group of friends with my address and a request to call 911 to help get me from the property because I didn't feel safe walking in that neighborhood at night and didn't have enough reception to call a new ride but the message wasn't sent. Reception was too weak. So I gave up on getting my phone going and started checking for another stairwell, or even a window with balconies or dumpsters that could be used to exit the second floor as a last resort, in the event whoever was downstairs came upstairs. I scrambled over to a door with a stairs sign on it, but the stairs were completely dilapidated and it was essentially just a straight drop down to the first floor. At that point the worst case scenario began to unfold. I heard whoever was downstairs begin making their way up the stairs. I thought fast and figured based on my walk about the floor was basically a giant loop, so I would have to wait for whoever this was to come up the stairs, wait for them to come all the way up and then sprint the opposite direction of wherever they were going and try to get down the stairs and out of the building in time to make it to the road without encountering them. I was not anticipating being chased or anything, but didn't want to piss off a druggie or have a homeless person who might be living there feel as though I trespassed and become hostile towards me, or have any sort of interaction that could possibly occur at that hour in an abandoned industrial park. I held my breath for what felt like 5 minutes but was likely closer to just 30 seconds and the person appeared at the top of the stairs. To my great relief, it was just the Uber driver. I figured he had come back from me, realizing he had left me in the wrong spot, a place that could have worked out to be dangerous. So I came out from the beam I was hidden behind and started to wave him down. But then I processed there was no way for him to realize this had been the wrong address. My stomach lurched forward and my blood chilled to slush. I made eye contact with him very briefly and he was completely calm and composed, but breathing pretty heavily, and blocking the stairwell down. On a normal, rational, day as an outside observer I could think of a dozen innocent reasons he might have returned, but in the moment, standing across from him, I just knew in my gut that this was someone with ill intent. 
I can't remember much more from the ensuing few minutes. Operating solely on muscle memory and instinct I superman dove for the second stairwell's opening and just let myself fall down the drop. Thankfully I don't think he'd seen where I'd gone at first, and though I was in too much pain to know it then, plenty was bruised but nothing was completely broken. I scrambled up and threw myself at anything that seemed like it could be the door. It was too dark to tell, I was disoriented from the fall, and I wasn't in a calm enough mindset to think to use my phone flashlight, plus, in hindsight, some part of me probably knew it would call too much attention to my location. Just before I was able to reach the door, it flew open with the blinding light beaming straight into my eyes. My first thought, though not totally coherent, was, there's another one of these guys, A-A-H-H. And I stumbled backwards, trying to find something to hide behind. Before I could, a voice called out, All right, this is the name of town police department. Everyone get on your knees with your hands in the air. I didn't believe it was the police at first. I was in such a fight-or-flight mode and had already committed to flight that I continued looking for ways to get out. But he kept shining the flashlight right at me as I teetered around and yelled, Hey, I sat on the ground, right now. Hands out, hands out where I can see them. He sounded so authoritative that I just automatically did exactly as he asked. He approached me and finally shined the light away from me. It took a second to get my night vision but once I did I could see he was really a police officer. I tried to explain what was happening but first he started asking me all these questions and that, combined with what had just happened, and my fear of the driver coming back, all snowballed into my being unable to form a single articulate sentence. He was even asking easy questions like, can you tell me your name? Do you have any knives, needles, or anything that could poke or cut me? Would you rather talk here or outside? And my total stunned babbling in response at first led him to believe I was onto something. He directed me out to his car, and once I was safely out of the building, I was able to start getting my bearings just a little. I sat on the edge of the back seat of the squat car, with the door open facing out, while he stood across from me and asked the same questions again. The first thing I could think to ask was, did my friends call you? What did they tell you? And he explained no, nobody called him. He was patrolling the area and noticed a car idling outside of this building that's known to be condemned, and nobody's supposed to be inside, and, when they are, they're not up to no good. He was launching into a speech about how if I'd gone to shoot up or meet a John he had resources he could direct me to and that this was not an ideal place to do either of those things and asking if I had somewhere safe to stay that night. But I was stuck on something else he'd said. Finally it all clicked. The car. I spilled my whole rideshare story in a frantic word vomit. He looked around and the car wasn't there anymore. The officer guessed the guy had driven off while we were talking inside the building. He asked me all the details I remembered and I told him, but there weren't many. I'd been too tired when the ride started to track much. But the officer realized I could pull up my Uber app and get all the information. There wasn't really enough reception there, even outdoors, so we sped down the road and once I had enough bars the app roared to life and I had four missed notifications from Uber. They said, hello, I've arrived, and I don't see you. Can you confirm the pickup address is correct? And I'm flashing my hazards. And finally, unfortunately your driver had to cancel. At first I thought the driver was so cunning as to pick me up while sending these fake messages and canceling so the GPS wouldn't track us, knowing I wouldn't notice because I was asleep with my phone off and exonerating himself. But instead I checked the car details, checked again, and it was definitely not the same driver. The person who'd driven me there had not been my Uber. My driver was somewhere else on the street when this guy pulled up to me. The policeman took my statement and said they would keep an eye out for the guy, but the best I could give them to go off of was basically, young-looking Caucasian man with brown hair, sideburns, goatee, and four-door sedan, wearing a zip-up sweatshirt. Maybe I had a hood? Which is, like, one out of every four guys in this city. I feel so blessed to have survived this near miss. Suffice it to say, I do not take rideshare services anymore. Quadruple check your license plate and driver name. You just never know. This happened over 20 years ago. 
I was driving back home with my girlfriend at the time. It was Christmas Eve, and my mother's family used to hold a large celebration at my aunt's house in Estacada. This was my girlfriend's first time meeting with my extended family, but she got on quite well with them. We spent the majority of the afternoon and evening talking, playing poker, opening presents, and drinking an assortment of adult beverages. My girlfriend had been quite inebriated by the time we had to leave. Therefore, I'd be driving us home. It was around 11 p.m. or so. I was driving my girlfriend's car along Highway 211. Now, this stretch of road is surrounded by farms and dense patches of forest, and parts of it are unlit. But nothing to fear, I grew up in this area, so I knew this road like the back of my hand. The both of us were just driving and talking away, just two young lovers making the most of our moment together. There is a portion of the highway that descends down an enormous hill before crossing Deep Creek. Surrounding both sides of the road are thick forests. There are no lights. The only thing we could see was the area directly in front of our headlights. I drive down the hill, cross the bridge, and uphill through more forest. It's as the highway starts to flatten out that it happens, something sprints across the road so suddenly that I almost hit whatever it was. I slam on the brakes. I turned to my girlfriend and asked her if she saw it. She confirmed that she had, but she couldn't make out what it was. Maybe it was a coyote, as they are a fairly common sight in this area. But something felt off about it. Whatever it was that ran in front of the car disappeared into the woods next to the road. Coyotes don't usually just dart out in front of cars. Not like that anyway. So for some reason, I decided to check it out. I turned the car around and switched on the high beams to better light up the forest in which this thing had vanished. I step out of the car, and walk towards the woods. I don't see anything, but now it feels like perhaps I'd made a grave error. My heart is pounding, and the hairs on the back of my neck are standing at full attention but I still don't see anything unusual in the trees. Suddenly the car's horn blasts. It's not a beep 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 that you get if, say, your driver or passenger wanted you to hurry up and get in the car. No, this was a long blaring beep. I walk back into the car, and ask my girlfriend why she leaned on the horn like that. She said nothing, instead, she pointed to a spot about 50 feet from where I was standing. I looked over in that direction, and that's when I saw it. Surely this was the thing that ran in front of our car. It was a man. He was completely naked. His skin was covered in dirt and mud. And in one of his hands, he was holding a hatchet. He looked back at us. And then, he smiled and waved to us just before turning around and walking back into the forest. Needless to say, we got the hell out of there. Once we were safely driving again, my girlfriend explained what had just happened. While I was trying to look for the man in the area he initially vanished in, he circled back around and came out from another spot in the forest, beyond my car headlights. My girlfriend had seen something out of the corner of her eye, and that's when she saw him. Before she honked the horn, he was walking towards me, his hatchet raised as if making to strike me. We called the authorities once we got safely back home, but they never found anybody, or they did and just didn't tell us. But the officer we spoke to explained his theory. The man was obviously looking to ambush unsuspecting lone travelers for the Lord only knows what reason. We all agreed that my girlfriend's quick thinking saved my life as it let my potential killer know that I wasn't alone out there. I moved back into the area recently, so I now drive that highway often. No naked hatchet man sightings yet, but I can tell you that I'm definitely extra vigilant now, especially near Deep Creek. This happened to my very close family friends on Christmas Day a few years ago. I used to babysit for this family starting around age 12 and I later house slash dog sat for the months at a time all throughout my 20s. This story is particularly creepy for me because I have spent a ton of time alone at their house. Main story. So this family is enjoying a stereotypical Christmas day evening in the family home. It's winter and so it's dark very early. It's a drizzly, wet, foggy night outside. It's a large family and the kids are all grown, in their 20s slash 30s, most with jobs out of state, but everyone has come home to be together for the holidays. Siblings are busy playing with Christmas loot, TVs are all on, Christmas music is playing, food is being cooked and eaten, and there's a lot of laughing and talking. This goes on for many hours. The youngest daughter spots her dad standing in the middle of the courtyard outside in a black hooded sweatshirt. The hood is over his head so just his mouth and chin are visible and he's just looking in at the house. She casually calls over to her mom, who's in the kitchen, to go check on dad because it seems like he needs help with something in the yard. Except mom says dad is in the bedroom taking a nap. Mom and sister quickly come to the realization that there is a creepy total stranger in a black hoodie just staring in at them, not moving, on Christmas Day evening. As you can imagine, 
the family collectively shits enough bricks to build another chimney for Santa. They proceed to alert everyone in the house, run around checking the locks on the many many sliding glass doors and windows, and wake up dad. In the meantime, Black Hoodie Creep can see everyone's movements because the house is pretty much completely glass window walls. This guy continues to just stand there in an intentionally creepy, Jason-like, pose, not moving, except now he has a sinister smile on his face. It's obvious that he is enjoying being caught. At first the family thinks it might be a practical joke. The family members start to call out things to intimidate him like, if this is a joke, it's not funny. We already called the cops. We have a gun but the guy just keeps standing there, smiling and not moving for a long time. Then suddenly, he rushes up to the glass and starts pounding on it, not saying a word, his face still obscured by the hood. Obviously, he is intentionally trying to scare everyone, if not break into the house, and now the family really does call the cops. After pounding on the glass for a good while, he runs and hops the fence near the home's trash cans and heads to the neighbor's yards. The neighbors are also good friends, so the family calls to let them know what is happening, but they never see the black hoodie man. The cops arrive within minutes, take the statements, check all the neighboring houses, but never find this guy. Not long after, the family had their courtyard area completely remodeled, including a new security and light system. The scariest bit of this story, for me, is that they have no idea how long this guy was just standing there watching them enjoy their Christmas. Bonus details. The home where this took place is in a quiet upper-class neighborhood. It's a square home with an interior square courtyard situated on the edge of a steep hill with a busy six-lane road below. It would be very difficult to climb this hill and scale the back wall to access the back porch area and even harder to escape down without falling into the traffic below. It would also be hard to exit the neighborhood, unless climbing through people's yards, without being spotted by the cops. The home is angled in such a way that the wind blows right through it, causing creaks slash drafty sounds on even mildly windy days. A rustle or crunch sound would most likely be ignored. The home's layout is similar to many traditional Japanese homes, with sliding doors attached to each section of the house, leading to the square middle courtyard, except rather than wooden panels or screens, this home is all sliding glass window hallways. If someone is in the central courtyard at night, it is very easy to see into all areas of the house without being seen due to the reflection of the lights inside, however the courtyard does have some dull footway lighting. Home is beautiful, but they have some creepy art, including stone statues of children playing in the courtyard and a collection of cringe clown art that was so popular in the 80s. Also their senior dog used to growl intently at empty hallways in the middle of the night, probably was just blind slash deaf but still freaky. I was often unnerved while sitting for them, even before this happened. Home has a floor to roof iron front gate, impossible to climb over, and a wooden gate, possible to climb, leading to trash can storage slash adjacent to neighbor's wooden fence. These are the only access points to the central courtyard. My conclusion. This guy was a crazy ex slash old school friend playing a prank on one of the, now adult, kids, but years have passed and it was never revealed so this seems unlikely. Another conclusion, this guy had some mental problems and slash or was possibly a peeping Tom type pervert, and was just having an episode. Lastly, this was a home alone type situation, where some guy was squatting in nice homes, counting on the fact that people won't be home for the holidays, and possibly decided to have some fun with this family once he was spotted. I seriously doubt this single guy was planning to actually take on a family of six plus adults. I have not stayed alone in the house since, as the dog I used to watch passed away some time ago. I would love to hear your thoughts slash reactions. Not as crazy as some people's stories but was such a terrifying experience for me. So, a small bit of background, I'm from a small rural town set in the East Midlands in the UK, and everything is quite spread out. My mum lived on a small street on the edge of town, tucked up into the corner with very little lighting from street lights at the time, the council turned some off in certain areas to save money. The street was a dead end, and shaped like a T, with my mum living at the dead end at the top on the left. I'm also about 5 feet 2 inches and weighed about 105 pounds at the time. The incident happened on Christmas Eve, in 2011, so I was only 21. I was visiting home from my university up north for Christmas and had gone out with some friends from the area for a catch-up and to celebrate the season. It had gotten late and I needed to catch a taxi to get home. I didn't want to call my mom at 1am Christmas morning to come and pick me up, and it was too far to walk. My friends had all headed home, as they lived much closer to the town center. Unfortunately, I hadn't realized that the taxis were all charging double fares because it was Christmas, and had only saved 10 pounds, the usual amount it would cost me to get back, rather than the 20 pounds it was going to cost me that night. 
I didn't have my bank card, silly, I know, and thought that I was going to have to wake my mum up after all, when one driver pointed out that it was Christmas, so he would do it for the ten pounds. He leant over and opened the passenger door and I climbed in. Now, in the UK, black hackney cabs don't really take passengers in the front seat, you're meant to sit in the back area normally. I was drunk and honestly just grateful for the ride, and didn't think anything of it. I gave him the street name and we set off. He seemed very friendly, asking how my night had been, what my Christmas plans were, and just regular chatter. At some point I mentioned that I was visiting from university and he asked what I was studying, to which I replied motorsport engineering. At this point, he became fascinated with me and what I was studying. He kept making comments about how he would never have imagined a girl as young and beautiful as me would be interested in cars, how amazing that was, that he thought it was incredible, etc etc. I thought it was odd, but I'd had some weird reactions when people found out what I did before, I apparently don't look like an engineer, whatever that looks like, so I just smiled and nodded to keep things friendly, as we were nearly on my street. Then things got a bit weird. We pulled up in my street, a few doors down from my house and of course, it was super dark. I'm drunk, tired and a bit creeped out by his obsession with me and what I study at this point, he's still going on about how he never would have believed it, I was too pretty for that, he would love to see me working on cars, etc so I just try to give him the money and get out. But he won't take it, just ignores my hand waving the money around, and keeps talking. He had also learned a lot closer at this point. I tried the door handle to let myself out, but the locks were engaged and I couldn't find any way of unlocking it in the dark. He completely ignored my attempts to open the door and just kept talking to me. I can't remember everything he said anymore, mostly he carried on the same way he had been, but with more references to watching me bend over. I was really freaked out by this point and had tried to say that I needed to go several times but he just kept ignoring me, and saying he loved how incredible I was. He didn't even know me. We'd been sitting in the dark at the end of my street for about half an hour at that point, with his engine and lights off. There was no way anyone from the houses would have even been able to tell there was anyone in the car if they had looked out of their windows. Then I saw a light turn on in my next door neighbor's window, up the street from us, and blurted out, oh that must be my mum waiting up for me, I better head in before she calls and starts to worry. The look on his face was genuinely terrifying. He looked like a combination of angry, disappointed and also contemplative. Like he was trying to decide something. I waved my money at him again and pulled on the door handle and he popped the locks and let me out. I ran all the way to my front door and let myself in, before locking everything behind me, and peeking out the curtains. He didn't drive away for another few minutes, and I remember being aware that he saw me go into my house, and also must have known that I lied about the light being my mum, it wasn't even my house. I never saw him again and went back to university four days later. I told my mom what happened and she insisted on driving me around for the rest of my stay. To this day I still get nervous taking taxis and always message someone when I have to use one so that they know where I am and when to expect me. So creepy taxi driver, let's not meet. I was 23 when I started working full time at everyone's favorite supermarket. I had struggled through over three years of college before deciding to get a full-time job and had worked a trial full-time job for six months before becoming a greeter a year before it was changed to something more serious. I look younger than I am and people have asked if I was still in high school or if I had a boyfriend, and I was ignorant enough to be used to those questions under a work environment. I also have anxiety, so I worried about customer service more than my own comfort zone most of the time in that position. I soon started to keep work journals detailing what I saw on a daily basis or anything I found suspicious, which came in handy for me in my opinion. There was this older gentleman that needed to use an electric cart to get around an EFS that I helped from time to time since I normally watched the secondary doors. He introduced himself as L, claimed to be in his 70s, and required the electric cart because of all the smoking he did since his younger years. I'll normally would strike up long conversations about his life after he was done shopping that he would stay at least another five or so minutes before leaving, including asking if I had a boyfriend and, at one time, making up scenarios of meeting a potential boyfriend. As stated before, I was used to hearing the boyfriend question so much that I stick with saying, I don't have a boyfriend and I'm not looking to find one anytime soon. I took this as me lying to get out of the situation when I was telling the truth. I also overlooked a lot of what he said most of the time because it was normally loud when these conversations happened, he had a rasp to his voice, which was proof of the smoking information he told me, and I thought they were things that were the norm from his time. As a retail worker, I felt it would have been rude if I ignored him and it gave a reason to think that I was his friend. 
I didn't start seeing red flags about his behavior until late November 2018 when he told me that I looked pretty and that he wouldn't imagine me naked. It made me uncomfortable, but I awkwardly thanked him for the compliment and he went about his shopping before I documented it down. Red flag number two came a month later, the day after Christmas and sometime after my birthday. Earlier that day, I was talking to fellow greeter Tom, a male in his mid-fifties, about when greeter Queenie would let us go on our breaks after empty dew spilled when I came in to do his shopping and after he was done and I was helping him transfer groceries to a push cart, he said he saw me talking to Tom in a monotone sounding voice and left without going into a conversation, it was enough to scare me. Red flag number three came not even a week into the new year. Al came back to do some shopping and tried to strike up a conversation with me after he was done, but noticed how I was trying to focus on my job more than him. This prompted him to ask if he made me uncomfortable, and I told Al I didn't want to be rude as I thought telling him would make him upset at the time. Al told me that he sees me as a friend and that whenever he comes in, he looks to see if I'm working because I'm the friendliest greeter compared to everyone else before he left. I could tell he wanted to put me at ease, but it did the opposite as I found I was right to be paranoid about him. I started to actively avoid Al if I ever saw him again and was alone at either door, acting like I was busy and having an assistant manager switch me and Queenie to different doors whenever the two of us worked alone in the morning. It worked for a month until greeter Nora came and gave Queenie her breaks when she wanted them. Come February, I'm gathering baskets when I spot Al at the register that sells tobacco and he says, hi, to me, but I ignored him and hurried away. I later asked one of my managers to use the restroom and hid in there until I couldn't hear him. Self-checkout host Dory had noticed how uncomfortable I was as Al recounted that he thought he might have insulted me because he asked if I had a boyfriend. He then told her everything he was saying to me and Dory understood why I was so uncomfortable. She later told me that Al was very vocal about me ignoring him until he left. I told two other co-workers as I was trying to catch up in my journaling as I had fallen behind in it, and they told me to escalate the situation to the head of loss prevention, Rebecca. I eventually did once I had three entries written down and marked as my evidence, and told Rebecca what I had been doing to avoid Al. I was afraid to tell anyone in management without any evidence as I was worried I'd be brushed off as an anxious worker, but Rebecca took me seriously and said I was doing the right thing by avoiding him. Since my journaling included times and dates, I was able to give Rebecca the time frame Al was most commonly coming in to shop at the time, sometime between 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., closer to the end of the month, and mainly Sundays. With that in mind, I was told to keep an eye out whenever Al ever came back in and to point him out to her or her team as his actions could lead to sexual harassment of the customers as well. In March, I was surprised to see all come in at a later time and act more professional around me, keeping things to hello and goodbye instead of trying to make conversation. Even with the change of attitude, I still kept my guard up. Near the end of the month, around 6.50 at night, Al stated how nice the weather was and asked me if I could help him out to his car with his groceries so I could take the electric car back inside. It's EFS's policy that the electric carts stay inside to avoid any damage to them unless the customer physically can't get to the store without heavy assistance, so I politely said he had to use a push cart as the electric cart can't go outside and I'd get him one. Al was a bit insistent in taking the electric cart out and was halfway through the entryway, but I pushed the push cart close to the electric cart and politely insisted that the electric cart stay inside to avoid getting damaged from pebbles and dust that could get into the cart. Al relented for that reason, had his groceries put into the push cart and left. I was relieved that the situation hadn't escalated so I had to help him, but I did take note of his car should I get an idea to try and follow me home. That was also the only time he ever asked for me to help him outside. I eventually told Nora that I didn't feel comfortable around Al and she said that I wasn't the only young woman he had said these things to, as he said things like this to other female workers at other EFSs since Nora had transferred over from the west location in the city. A little over halfway into April, I switched over to cashiering and put together more information about Al's visits so I could try to avoid serving him by myself, coming in around the time food stamps were replenished and within the 7 to 10 days at the end of the month, mainly on Sundays and Fridays and during the 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. time frames. Luckily enough, I didn't see Al after the switch. Even more coincidentally at the start of May, I found an online article by the local newspaper with a picture of who looked to be Al in my Twitter timeline. I didn't want to get my assumptions up and had Nora look at the picture two days later. To my shock, Nora confirmed it was Al. Reading the article revealed that Al had spilled gravy on his laptop and took it into Popular Electronics to get the files recovered when the IT people found what appeared to be illicit pictures of children during the recovery and called the police. Al admitted to saving the photos and was able to describe what he saved and was arrested. The article also revealed that Al wasn't his real name, 
that he was really in his mid-fifties and was from a nearby city in Iowa, which explained why he mainly came in on weekends. I told everyone that knew the story and they were equally shocked, but also relieved. I did research on his state laws on the charges against Al a few days after his scheduled court appearance and found that he was guaranteed at least two to ten years in prison at the least an immediate registration as a sex offender. In October, I decided to do more research as it had been months and found more articles confirming that Al copped a plea deal for two years and over $600 in fines for each count against him and was sentenced in September. I had switched to another position on the sales floor by the time I found out about the sentencing. It's been over two years since then and I have my old co-workers and Rebecca to thank for giving me the fact and confidence that I do have the option to tell a customer no if I feel something isn't right, but I can't help but think about how badly things could have gotten if I had helped him out to his car and if he had other intentions in mind. It should also be noted that any electric car policies are put in place not only to maintain the functionality of the car, but to also protect the employees from injury or other harm at any store electric carts are provided and I was lucky to enforce this policy when I did.